everyone. Really good to uh, see all of you guys here. As you guys know, we have been on our series prayer, and we've been going over the Lord's Prayer together. Jesus is trying to teach us how to pray, how to pray well, how to pray so that there actually makes a difference in our lives. Last week, we talked about our favorite part of prayer. Do you guys remember what it was? What is our favorite part about praying? Give us our daily bread, which is God, give me this, give me that. Today, we're going to go from, I think, our favorite part, which is give me, give me, give me, to another give me, give me, but something that we actually have a really, really difficult time with. So basically what I'm saying is we're going from the most favorite part of our prayer, what I think, and I think we're going to our least favorite part of prayer for a lot of us. So let's read it together. Uh, can you go to the next slide for me? This then is how you should pray. Let's uh, read it together. One, two, three. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Favorite part? Give us, give us, give us. And now we get to forgive me as I've forgiven those people who have wronged me. We're going to talk about two different reasons why this is very, very difficult for us to pray. Let's go to the first part, which is this part right here. Forgive us of our debts. Now, the society that we live in is what we call, in the um, theological circle, we call it post-Christian world. Okay? What we mean by post-Christian world is before, we used to live in a world that was full of Christendom in the Western society for the most part. Until about 1800s, it was everybody, most of the people were Christians, whether they liked it or not. Okay? So their worldview was, there is God, and God actually judges, and God actually cares how we live our lives. But we live now in a post-Christian world, which means now not a lot of people in the Western civilization are necessarily Christian. Nor do most people actually believe that there is God. If anything, even in education, they say, hey, don't you understand? God didn't create us. We just came from a, a very tiny little cell, and it evol evolved and from monkeys, and then after that, voila, it became us. So there is no God. So what does that mean? That also means that there is no ultimate ethics either. There is no ultimate morality. So you're going to hear things like this. You're going to hear things like, hey, you believe that? Good for you, bro. You believe what you want to believe, and if that is right for you, that's okay. But I'm going to believe whatever is right for me. Have you guys heard that? Or maybe you've used it before. Okay? It's this concept that how dare you tell me what to, how to live my life or what is good, what is sin, and what is not. Okay? Uh, this is a very, very famous um, a poem uh, that I think perfectly describes uh, the ideology that we have about our own life. Um, my, this thing is not working. Next slide for me. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, right here. It matters not how straight the gate. This is talking about, you know, how in the Bible it talks about how there's a narrow gate. And he's saying, rubbish. Rubbish. There is no such thing as right or wrong or what gate is right, what gate is wrong. No, the gate is wide. Why? Because you get to choose your own morality. You do whatever you want to do. Uh, next part, it says, how charged, oh, go back. How charged with punishment the scroll. What is this talking about? This is talking about the commandments, right? In the Bible, it says, do not do this, do not do No. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about those things. Don't worry about pun God punishing you. What are you talking about? God doesn't exist. You create your own. Why? Because then I become the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. And so it goes with morality as well. So therefore, this idea of forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, sounds ridiculous in this society. 
sin, sin, what sin are you talking about? Okay, the, don't you understand the Bible? It's this ancient book, a bunch of these ancient laws. What? They're so oppressive. They tell you not to have sex before marriage. They're so oppressive and repressive. They're shaming you with sex. Or if there's Bible verses about homosexuality, they go, oh, what's wrong with two men or two female who love each other? How backward thinking is the Bible saying that this is sin and you need to repent? Or things like now, a big thing is gender. Whether you're male or female, Bible says God created male and female. And no, that's ancient way of thinking. Whatever you want to believe, whatever. So who cares what the Bible says? Who cares about sin? So does that make sense? Forgiveness, you don't need forgiveness if you don't think you have a sin problem. If you don't think that you're doing anything wrong, you're living a wrong life, then you're not going to need forgiveness either. So more and more and more, our society is saying, you don't need to apologize for stuff. Why? Because you get to choose your own morality for yourself. Now, that sounds all fine and dandy and everything, and a lot of us, we are affected by that. But the problem is, practically speaking, it doesn't work. Okay? We can say all we want all day long, I'm okay, I don't need forgiveness from God because God doesn't even exist. I'm fine, everything is fine in my life. There's no sin, I'm all right. The way I'm living, I'm the master of my soul, whatever. And yet... This is not the case. What I mean by that is more and more counselors and more and more psychologists are realizing this is just not true at all. There's a story of a counselor who came to a pastor and said, hey, I want you to start up a counseling business with me. And the pastor said, why? You're a psychologist. You could do it by yourself or you could find other psychologists. I'm, I'm a pastor. What, are you gonna, what do you need me for? And he said, majority of my clients, what they're seeking for at the end of the day, I realized after working these uh, um, uh, a few years, I realized what they're looking for is forgiveness. And me as a counselor, me as a psychologist, I cannot, I could tell them about you know, forgiveness and things like that, but I cannot grant them forgiveness. So you as a pastor, you can come along. I could guide him through, and at the end, you could come along and you could say, I forgive you, or God forgives you. Another psychologist said, 90% of my patients would not need me as a counselor if they truly believed that they were forgiven. Does that make sense? So, on the head level, yeah, all these pundits, all these poets, poems, are, yeah, whatever, there is no sin. Nothing's wrong with my life, where I'm living. It doesn't matter. And yet, so many people are living with guilt and shame. If there is, if you are the master of your soul, why are you feeling so guilty? Why do you have so much shame in your life? So it doesn't work. What we're saying and how, what we see in reality doesn't match up. There's a movie a long time ago called Old Boy. Okay? Um, and there's another book, uh, maybe if you don't know the book, uh, uh, if you don't know the movie Old Boy, uh, the book, there's a book, I think it's very similar. I don't know if they copied each other or not, but it's by, maybe some of you guys had to read this in, in, in your high school. It's, it's called The Trial by Kafka. I forgot his first name. It, it just left my mind. If you guys remember, just shout it out. Okay? Something Kafka. Anyways, he also uh, wrote Metamorphosis. Anyways, the basis of both the movie and the book is one day he wakes up and he's in prison. And he doesn't know why he's in prison. And all throughout the movie and the book, by the way, don't read the book if you want to be depressed. It's a very depressing book and the movie both. Um, but basically throughout the whole movie, they're trying to figure out, what did I do wrong? Okay, what did I do wrong? I seem innocent. I don't feel like I deserve punishment, and yet I'm being punished. And again, that's what a lot of us feel, is we've been told by society, we've been told by the world, just... Gener just justify this away. Okay, just say this is not really a sin problem. This is not a big deal. And yet, 
we live with so much guilt and shame. We walk around with it. The Bible gives us an alternate view of this. It doesn't just look at the world and say, it doesn't look at us and just say, whatever you're doing, everything is fine. It doesn't say that. It actually tells us that there was a creator, a God who created all, every single one of us in here. And he gave us the perfect world. And yet we were not satisfied with that. We were not content with that. And we said, no, we don't want God. We rather, we rather be the captain. We rather be the master of our fate. And so there is this deep longing that we have. Why? Because we are not at home. We were not designed to be the captain and the master of our faith, and yet we're continuing to try. And because of that, our system continues to tell us, no, this is not right. Something is off. The Bible doesn't tell us that you don't have guilt anymore, that you don't have shame anymore, there's no sin. No, the Bible tells us there is sin. There is deep level of sin. That's why there is deep level of guilt and shame within you as well. It describes why you are actually in jail, why you are actually in prison. There's two types of people in here as I'm talking about this. Okay, two types of people. One type of people, when I'm talking about sin and forgiveness, you go, very similar to this guy, you go, I know I'm not perfect, but I don't, I don't really need God. Okay, it's not that important. I can live with this guilt and shame, or what shame, what guilt? Okay, there's that type of people in here. But there's, I know another, another extreme of people in here that all you, you know guilt and shame by name. You live with it every single day. You look at the mirror and all you see is your guilt and shame. There's a, there's a um, famous, um, I'm sure some of you guys have read uh, in high school or college, Macbeth by Shakespeare. Macbeth, is a, is a, he's a king, or he becomes the king because he kills the king. Okay? And he has to live with that guilt, and he describes it like this. Next slide for me. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. This hand will rather the multitudinous seeds incarnate making the green one red. So poetically, he's basically saying, when I look at my hand, all I see is blood. All I see is guilt and shame. Is there any water that will wipe me of this redness? But he says, no. Even if I put my hand in the water, my hands will not be clean. I will pollute the ocean itself. I will make the green ocean or the blue ocean even redder with my guilt and shame. Some of you guys, you live without guilt and shame. Okay, so in that sense, wherever you are, whatever spectrum, whether you think, I'm fine, my life is fine, and yet there is no peace in your life. Or whether you have no peace in your life because all you see is guilt and shame, do you see how important it is for us to pray God? Forgive us of our debts. Jesus actually tells us to pray this. Okay? Why does he want us to pray this? Because he doesn't want any of us, whatever, whatever spectrum you are on, he doesn't want us to be burdened with our guilt and shame. Some of us, again, we don't see it, but we feel the effects of it. Some of us, we live with it every single day and we see the effects of it every single day. Regardless, whether you are conscious of it or not conscious of it, Jesus is basically saying, I want you to understand that there is someone who deals with your pain and suffering, who deals with your guilt and shame. Okay? He's telling you to come to him. Do you understand that? Or do you see God who wants to inflict more guilt and more shame onto you? Or do you see a God, remember, our Father in heaven, He's not somebody who's trying to, this like big God who's just trying to, hey, look at all these bad things, horrible things you're doing. In 
And yet again, our Father in heaven, if you see that God actually wants to rid you of the guilt and shame you have, and that he's a good father who wants you to feel peace and have freedom. Then again, we see why this prayer becomes very, very important to every single one of us. But that's only the first part. For some of us, we really, I think most of us, in the beginning we might say, oh, I don't really like this, forgive us our debt. But once we process it, we go, oh, yeah. God who knows all of my sins, all of my mistakes, and yet is still willing to embrace me and forgive me? Sign me up for that. But the second part of the prayer is where we really get into problem. Forgive us our debts as, what does it say? It doesn't just end there. As we have also forgiven our debtors. This is really hard. If you, you have to understand, both of these things, Jesus could have ended it right there, right? Just forgive us our debt. And it's really funny because when we pray, we do this, right? We go, God, I confess for my sins. And the next. We never say, God, forgive me of my sin because I also gave, forgave other people. We don't talk about other people, right? We don't forgive about the bitterness that we have towards other people. But Jesus doesn't say that, right? Jesus says, forgive me as I have forgiven other people. Now, this is really, really important because anybody, whether you are Christian or even a non-Christian, prays, forgive me. Why? Because nobody wants to walk around with guilt and shame. And because of that, they're totally fine praying, forgive me. God, I messed up. Forgive me. But to see whether you truly understand the gospel or you truly understand Christianity is whether you can pray not, forgive me, but forgive me as I have forgiven somebody else. Okay? So what I'm trying to tell you, focus, is the best way to know whether you are a true Christian or not is not just, God, forgive me, but in your actions, okay, in your day-to-day, -day, are you able to forgive other people? around you. That will show you a converted heart or not. Because anybody can just say, forgive me. But only a converted heart, only someone who is forgiven can forgive other people as well. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. Okay? You are not really forgiven. You, you do not understand the sins that you have unless you understand that you can forgive other people. Does that make sense? The best example of this comes from Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, there's a king. And the king has many different servants. And you guys know the story. One of the servants has taken, he is responsible, or he has borrowed the king's money. Okay? Uh, in our days, the equivalence, we think, is about... $13 billion. So basically, in general, it's saying no matter how much money you make over in your lifetime, you cannot pay. This, this is not something you could just pay back. Even if you borrow money from everybody, you, this is not a money that you can pay back. So he comes in front of the king, and he says, King, give me more time. I'll pay it back. But the king knows. He knows this is unpayable. And yet, the king has compassion on the servant. And he says, I forgive you. The $13 billion canceled. He goes out. The servant goes out. He sees one of his coworkers. The coworker, he remembers, ah, that coworker owes me $100. Owes me 100 bucks. So what does he do? He goes up to him, grabs him, and says, hey, you owe me $100, bro. And shakes him. Okay, it doesn't say shake him, but I'll just say shake him. And, and the guy says the same thing. He says, please, give me some time. I could pay it back. Now, with that $100, you could pay it back. Just gives him some time. He'll pay it back. 
But he says, no. I'm going to report you, and you're going to prison. Okay, the king hears about this. The king hears about this. And he's angry. He's angry. And he says this. Next slide for me. He, in essence, says this. Uh, one more for me. He says, oh, sorry, one more. Then the master, the king, called the servant, you wicked servant. He didn't say, oh, come on. No, you're wicked. You're evil. There's still evil within you. Even though you've been, you say you are forgiven, you're an evil person. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? So he's in, in essence saying, I've forgiven you of this much. And yet, you're not willing to forgive him of that little. That does not make sense. And most of us in this room, we look at this and we go, this makes zero sense. If you've been forgiven $18 million, how can you not get, forgive somebody $100? It makes zero sense. And that's what he's trying to tell each and every one of us in here, in this room. He's trying to tell us, all the people that have hurt you, all the people that you are angry with, you're right that you're angry with them. Why? Because they owe you something. Yet, don't you understand? What you owe me, God is saying, is not even triple, not even 100 times more. It's, it's unpayable. And yet, I have forgiven you. How can you not forgive other person? Basically, in essence, what he's saying is, it doesn't make sense because this is not possible. If you don't realize that you were forgiven by God, you won't forgive other people. And that's, in essence, what Jesus is trying to say. He's saying, if my love towards you does not translate into love towards other people, that means you do not know my love. If my forgiveness towards you doesn't forgive other people, then that means you don't understand my forgiveness. Think about it this. Think about this. What if the servant... Remember, he went up to the king and he said, $18 million, all gone. But he didn't believe it. He didn't believe it. He believed, oh, king's, wait, you know. He said he verbally said, you know, it's gone, but I don't believe it. So now what does he have to do every time he goes out? He says, I need to gather as much money as possible. Oh, he owes me $100. I'm going to go out. Hey, give me $100. Why? I need it now so that I can repay my debt. Does that make sense? That's the only way it makes sense. Because why? He didn't truly believe that he himself was truly forgiven. And that's why when he sees somebody else, he doesn't forgive them either. Or a different way to think about it is this. I think some of us, I've been through this, where there's people in my life that have hurt me. Okay? And I go to God, and I go, God, I know in the Bible you say, forgive other people. Or it says, uh, just like what we have read, God, I need to forgive other people as I have, you have forgiven me. But God, I'm not as unreasonable as this person. Okay? Or this sin that this person has done to me, I never did that to you, God. I'm not that bad. Does that make sense? And so because of that, we go, $18 million, it's not that much. $100, that's so much worse. So there's this pride in our heart where we go, no, I will never be on the same level as this sinner. I I'm messed up too, but I'm not as messed up as this other person. It's kind of like a story that I heard that do you guys know in prison, there's a level of sin? There's like certain sins that you go in there and you're like bottom, bottom prisoner. But guess what? Every single one of them are prisoners. And yet they beat the lower, the other, the more sinful prisoner up. And again, that's what we're doing. We go, 
Yeah, I know I messed up, but not as bad as you, bro. So you don't deserve my forgiveness. And you definitely don't deserve God's forgiveness. I deserve it, but you definitely don't. And God is saying, does that make any sense? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is hard for us. This is extremely difficult for us to hear. Okay? And that's why I said, I told you guys in the beginning, right? We're okay with the God, give me stuff. I need stuff, give me stuff. We're okay being selfish. But when God calls us to forgive other people, to love other people, we go, oh, 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 oh. No, 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 God. Hold up there. And again, that's where you know whether you're truly converted or not. Not just you're receiving, receiving. Anybody can receive. But to be able to give as well, to be able to forgive, to love. That only happens when you are truly, truly forgiven. That can only happen if you're truly, truly loved by God. So why does Jesus teach us? Why does God tell us to do this? I think there's many, many different reasons. Many, many different reasons. But for me, I realized, I realized the best way for me to understand God's forgiveness towards me is when I start to learn to forgive other people. Okay, one more time. This is very important. The only way, I think, I started to realize God's forgiveness towards me, I understand this much better when I actually start doing this. Okay, what do I mean by that? I told you guys about forgiveness. There's people in my life, I'm like, you're just a horrible person. You don't deserve my forgiveness whatsoever. Not at all. Okay? And yet, God tells me I've done worse to God. So that means when God looks at me, he sees me the same. Because it's easy for me to think forgiveness is not a big deal when God forgives me. When God needs to forgive me, he was just like, oh, you, 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 oh, I love forgiving you. The sins that you do over and over and over again, the way that you hurt me over and over and over again, no problem. But I realize how difficult, when I forgive other people, how difficult it is for me, then I start to realize, wow, this must be really, really difficult for God as well. Do you understand? We talked about this many times, but it took, it wasn't as easy as, I love you guys, you guys are so wonderful to me, and I forgive you. Do you know what it took for God to forgive us? What did it take, guys? It took him sacrificing his son, sending his only one and begotten son to die for us instead. Okay? So all our sins are given to Jesus, and Jesus suffers the ultimate consequences. The Son of God is yelling out, God, you are forsaking me, you are forsaking me. Can you imagine what God is going through when he hears his son, his only child, Screaming out, Daddy, save me. Rescue me from this. How dare you forsake me? And yet, he says, this is what it takes to forgive. This is the cost of forgiveness. Don't think for any minute that it's easy for God to forgive us. It took extreme, extreme amount of love and patience to forgive us. So we have to understand that. Then we are able to do this with other people as well. A lot of us in here, we carry around guilt and shame. A lot of us in here. Some of you, you don't even know it. You don't even want to admit it. But Jesus here is offering forgiveness to you. Jesus is showing you a mirror, and it hurts. It hurts to look at it. 
And yet, he doesn't just say, ha ha, look at your sin, you suck. But he, want, he actually gives you the solution, the medicine as well. For those of you who are hurting so much because of your guilt and shame, same thing. The doctor is not saying, oh, you're suffering? Well, this is all the stuff you did wrong? And keep suffering. And until you suffer enough, oh, then I'll heal you. Yet Jesus actually tells us to pray, forgive us of our debts. So he wants to heal us. Some of us, maybe our, maybe our relationship with God, we feel like is good. But again, we're not able to forgive other people in our lives. And because of that, there is no peace. There's always this hidden anger or bitterness that you have towards other people. Because they have hurt you. But God is saying, you have hurt me just as much and I have forgiven you. And with that, you can forgive other people as well. There is beauty in forgiveness. I'm going to end with this quote. I believe, uh, this, I feel like um, he put it really, really well. And so I want to share this with you. Yeah, next for me. In the shadow of my hurt, forgiveness feels like a decision to reward my enemy. So if I think about this person has hurt me, this person has done this to me, then yeah, I should never forgive that person. It feels like I'm rewarding them for the good things they're doing. But in the shadow of the cross, what God has done for me, forgiveness is merely a gift from one undeserving soul to another. Forgiveness then is a gift that ensures my freedom from my prison of bitterness when I accept forgiveness from God, I'm set free from the penalty of my sin. But when I extend forgiveness to my adversary, there's a sense in which I set free from his sin as well. So not only am I set free vertically, but I can be set free horizontally as well. And that's what Jesus is teaching us to pray. Not only pray, forgive us, but forgive us as we have also forgiven our debtors so that we can experience true freedom, true peace that we can experience with God and with others as well. Uh, can you go one slide? This is our slide. Be kind, compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, why? Just as Christ Jesus forgave you. Be kind. God was kind to you. Be compassionate. God has been compassionate to you. Forgive, because God has forgiven you. All of you guys, me included, we're all forgiven so that we can forgive others as well. I hope you guys experienced that this week. Let's go into time of reflection.